All right. Hey, Bri. Cool. Um, we'll we'll kind of let people uh trickle trickle in here. Um how's uh how's uh how's life over at, at Harvey? Oh, it's quite good. It's uh it's definitely hectic. Um there is a lot going on, uh research. I, I think for people on this call, I'm I very recently joined to lead talent recruiting here. So I'm mostly doing recruiting. Uh so it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, let's and we'll we'll, we'll give we'll give, give folks a, a little bit more time to kind of um make their way in. And once they do, maybe we'll give you a, a chance to to reintro. Um yeah, and, and how, like AI, so AI pub, how'd you start AI pub originally? <laughs> It was like really random. I like there wasn't really a plan. I um I took a leave of absence from machine learning PhD up in UW, uh, in in Seattle. Um, wanted to do something kind of like small and entrepreneurial in the machine learning space. It actually started with a a blog uh, that I called Computer Vision Oasis. I mm -hmm. thought I would like publish articles and things like this on on computer vision, and basically no one read it. Um. And I started posting on Twitter about computer vision. And then I think with the whole like kind of foundation model paradigm shift over the last two years, one year, something like that, I kind of came to realize like it's more interesting to tweet about machine learning more broadly than, than narrowly computer vision. So then I started to do that. And then the Twitter account kind of blew up. Um, so that was kind yeah. of the story behind it. That's cool. And did, did, were you doing like in per, like when did the in person? Like I feel like in in the Bay, like the in person kind of AI explosion started to occur. I feel like you you did some of those early meetups. Like what when did that start happening? Like I feel like I kind of got sucked into it. I I definitely don't want to paint myself as starting any of it. Uh, I think <laughs> yeah. I think I mean so I like so I moved back here last summer from Seattle. Mm -hmm. There was honestly much less going on in Seattle. I think so. I don't. I, I mean, I think you have a much better sense because you've been yeah. in the Bay for a while, but um, yeah, I mean, I think when I moved back here, there were already a lot of events. I think, I mean, I think there's there's a kind of a lot of like, I think kind of VC and startup activity that I think really kicked up around the fall with ChatGPT. Yeah. Um, but even before that, there was, there was a lot going on. But I, I, I do think like after ChatGPT, there was... At least among kind of like big events, popular events, yeah, EC funded events, things like that. I think there was a big kick up in like starting October or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty pretty insane right now. I mean, now, now people have joined. Maybe maybe do an intro of yourself, um, and and then uh, we could kind of uh, yeah, intro yourself, your background, kind of where where you started, where you are now. But, look, sure. Yeah, sure. I'll I'll keep it short. So um, I uh, I'm Brian. I uh, dropped out of machine learning PhD at the University of Washington, interested in writing things like computer vision. Um, last year, I started a Twitter account called AI Pub covering like technical AI research topics, um, ran a podcast for a while with Jason and Arise um, covering like AI research papers. This is kind of a variant of that. Um, and also started like a talent referral business for AI startups where I met Harvey, uh, which is like a language models for law firms and kind of like systems of language models and software, generative AI software for law firm startup. Um, recruited for them for a really long time and just joined the team to lead talent recruiting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so that's what I'm up to. Awesome. And, and yeah, Harvey, we hear about everywhere. So um, a, a amazing. Amazing startup in the in in the kind of generative ecosystem. Um, you know, legal assistant kind of is is the focus. Is was my is my take at least. <laughs> uh, amazing legal, um, you know, legal assistant. And my you know, I think a lot of folks know me. Let's let's hop in. Uh, you know, founder founder hit arise. Um, and what we're going to do today is we're doing the the orca paper. Um, and uh. Yeah, do, do you want to kind of uh, get, give Brian? I'll let you kind of kick off. Like, what what do you do, do? You want to kind of describe your take of like the the abstract, like the big picture, and I can kind of do the same. Um, sure, sure, think. sure. Um, yeah, let me think here. So, I mean, I think the topic of Orca is this general topic of using a very large foundation model like GPT four that's very advanced, very intelligent, 
um, to train and fine tune a much smaller language model around 10 billion parameters. There are other examples of this, uh, you know, things like Vicuna, Llama, whatever. So there are other examples and of, of this trend. Um, and actually like, it's very engineering relevant. We do things like this um, at Harvey, you know, fine tuning fast language models using uh, large intelligent language models uh, to produce language models that are fast on given tasks. Um, and then the topic of this paper is kind of like improving the training process for these small language models where um, basically by using techniques that are similar to step-by-step -step prompting or chain of thought prompting, they think that and they demonstrate that they can fine tune these small language models to perform much better, one in general, but then two, especially on complex reasoning tasks. That would be my take on the paper, my sense of the paper at large. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a take. I mean, my, my one angle I probably would add to it is like, there, there's kind of a theme I feel in, in a lot of stuff recently, which is like, which is around, um, quality of data both both i think both training but definitely fine tune i, I think both are going to both matter um this one obviously focuses on on quality of data for fine tune and and i think there is there's kind of one school of thought or one, one way i was kind of thinking maybe last year which is like there's the, you know lots of data just throw lots of data at it uh i think this this the, the case here is going to be a bit for, more for the data matters the quality of data you fine tune on matters um the you know how how many and, and there was you know a recent paper from facebook where you know a thousand samples of of well thought through fine-tuning data you know beats vicuna so i think the goal of of this felt like can we beat vicuna can we get close to chat gpt with a very small model with very selective uh thoughtful data um and, and then how they produce that data from uh from a, a large foundational model there's some really unique ideas i think in this too um cool We'll kind of hop in. Um, I have the physical paper here, so <laughs> I'll scroll yeah. along with you. Yeah, no, I I, I feel like we're an old. Uh, we're, there, there's a generation who <laughs> I, I'm still in the, the the paper generation, but but there, there's a generation who probably you know rarely prints it out these days. The um the the early section here is like I I kind of we kind of highlighted here. Can can you use a model to super like? Can you use a large model to supervise and teach a small model? It's kind of the the beginning section here, um, and and you know, like we've been talking about, like the the teachers and um, you know, teachers and and, and, and using outputs from uh, a large language model. And, and I think the first was like was was probably Alpaca. The the Alpaca came out a couple of weeks after Llama dropped, which which was um, I think Alpaca was largely generated from from chat GPT in terms of like the, the data set. Um, so they were kind of like the very first example and that turned Llama from a kind of a nonsense or, or not, not a great foundation model to something that, you know, felt pretty decent. Um, so it was kind of like that first leap there was with that. And then the question here becomes, well, how do you extend, like, how does that idea extend beyond just this, this first incarnation? Um, uh, and then I think Vicuna was, I, I think it was Vicuna was the example where there's a, a website of chats of chat GP, of GPT for, you know, natural conversation. And then Vicuna kind of as an example where they, they just use, use those people posting their, their chats for that. So, so both of these kind of fit, fit that, like, you know, using a foundational model results to, to train a, a, a smaller model. What can you do with that? Um, yeah, I think I think one thing that was kind of also interesting from this uh, this section, and maybe it's a little bit negative, is they um, they kind of critique some of these other small language models, where they say that in the other papers, the authors of the other papers say that these language models perform just as well as say Chat GPT, but really it's only on a limited set of benchmarks, and if you end up kind of extending the benchmarks or you include more complicated reasoning tasks in the benchmarks, actually ChatGPT ends up performing better than these, these smaller models. Um, and I think that's, I, the sense I get is that's part of what motivated this paper. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think I think the, the example here too is like, I mean, it's kind of like, I would say um, some of it, you you'd you, like the Vicuna example here where, 
it was i think i think it was like seventy thousand examples like of, of shared chats with gpt are on this web we're, we're trained on this website and like you would think though that okay yeah it's probably might, might catch up it might might get some of the general feeling of responses but is it really learning anything in that fine-tuning process and i think they're kind of hinting here it's it's not like the you know it, when you look at reasoning or a real real tough you know problems that, that that's just not enough um uh, from from kind of a fine-tuned perspective um i think i mean if if, if we're chatting about these things I, I think one like interesting theme that i've been thinking about lately and maybe this is kind of obvious um is just the extreme difficulty of general benchmarking of mm -hmm. language models, especially yeah. with complex tasks. Yeah. It's like we're getting at the point where these language models perform better than humans in many domains. Um, this is obviously true at Harvey. Uh, with you know, we're trying to benchmark like language models for legal performance, both within specific legal domains, but then legal in general. It's like doing that is really, really difficult to just generically assess uh performance along a lot of benchmarks and like th this is this is kind of a theme among you know a lot of companies that are using language models to do complex human tasks i mean like you know, github copilot it's like i don't know how the the benchmarking for that works when they swap out a you know a different model or something like that but i i assume it's incredibly difficult um jasper how do you benchmark uh you know models for copywriting like what are the data sets for that like what are the various sub skills um so it's just very hard I, I I agree, and it's it's like the whole. I mean, I've, there's this whole area of model evaluation, which is like kind of call it blowing up, and like, um, and and if you look at OpenAI OpenAI evals, I mean, I'm I would looked at it the other day. I'm I was blown away by how much how many people have contributed evaluation sets to to that. Like, it's it's an insane number of those now, but it's still like such an early field. There was a a write up recently of hugging on hugging face of like why their leaderboard didn't you know, eval on the exact eval set didn't match a paper. And it was, um, and it was actually the harness itself was adding like both, both little bits to the prompt, uh, to, to, to the template, as well as like, even the way they measured that, that the harness was measuring the output differently for different like execution. So, so like the, the evals itself is such an early field. I think, I think they hit it a little bit in this paper, but I think that, I think, one thing that I think the paper does a good job though of is doing a really extensive eval. Like like part of the problem of Vicuna and and law and, and and alpaca was was you know you had pretty simple evals, but you didn't really see the holes or problems in the model itself. And you have to like run a lot more evals to on, on it to actually see those holes. Um but so the um total and in in this section, so this is kind of like challenges with existing models. Um and, and I think this is kind of like challenges with those, like the alpacas and and stuff. And really, it's kind of hinting at like their instructions and, and fine tuning data set were pretty limited, um, yeah, and and pretty simple. Um, you know, the task diversity of that fine tuning data set was not not you know not great. Um, the this example is talking about uh, human contributed to yeah. So this is talking about maybe the the Vicuna one. Um, content generation, information syncing queries, you know, got the style, but maybe not reasoning, like, which, which makes, which makes sense. Um, limited, I'm not quite sure. So limited. Yeah, yeah, I thought that the one thing that was kind of interesting for me here was the limited imitation signals, right? So it's like you train these things on query response pairs from say a big model like GPT-4. Um, it's kind of interesting is like the idea in part of this paper is that they wanted to enrich these signals. Mm -hmm. The way that the authors do it is basically via some kind of uh, chain of thought or step-by-step -step kind of more elaborate prompting of the model so that the model explains more of its reasoning process. Uh, but then they also talk about other, like, at least theoretical ways you could get imitation signals like logits, intermediate rep representations mm -hmm. or attention states. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, these are not, you can't do this with GPT-4 because these are not publicly exposed, but... Uh, if, if you could do, you know, if and when there is some kind of open source version of GPT-4, some kind of mega model that's open source, you could do something like this and, and potentially the training could get much better because you get much better intermediate representations. So I thought that was an interesting idea. Interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, that's, I, I like, I think this section, <laughs> it's section is kind of, 
you know, did, I hadn't thought about this much, like interesting kind of angle. Um, and then they do talk about like evaluations here. So I think we kind of hinted, we talked a little bit about like challenges with evaluation. Um, that, you know, the, the GPT-4 bias has been coming up quite a bit. I think you see that, like at, like the long text bias of, of GPT-4. They I, also I, said that when, when you're comparing two models, it likes like you're comparing two answers it actually just likes the first one a little bit better okay <laughs> oh wow yeah. that's funny yeah I, I there's probably a lot of subtle you know subtle things to figure out when you're using i mean it, it, you know I, I i was uncomfortable in the beginning probably like you thinking about like oh using a model to evaluate a model i've i've grown comfortable with it but there it feels like there's so many nuances to it that like we, we all need to kind of figure out um and you know, it feels like it's the only way to really scale these valuations, but there's there's a lot to unpack in, in terms of mistakes it can make. Um, key contributions. Do you want to, like, I feel like you had some thoughts on these. Um, sure. I feel like this section is kind of dense. I feel like it's kind of, it's a, it's a condensation of basically the whole paper. Um, we can go step by step through it. Uh, let me think. So yeah so i mean to me the kind of main sauce of the paper the main like secret sauce the main idea of the paper at least personally is just augmenting this query response process so like what the previous papers with like vicuna and llama alpaca etc have done is they just train on a set of queries of query to a language model and then the response from the language model basically how this whole paper works is they add like one layer on top of that, where instead of it being a query and then a response, and maybe let's like give an example so that it's clear. Um, this is this is kind yeah. of maybe simple. We'll skip it ahead, but yeah, yeah, right there. So yeah, if you actually scroll forward like one page. Yeah. Yeah, so here's, so previously the, the way that these models were trained is basically just these latter two instructions where it's like use the given data to calculate the median. That's the input, and then you get the output, right? Yeah. Um, kind of the to me, the main idea of this paper is to just add this first additional prompt, uh, which is a system instruction. It says you are an AI assistant, which will give you a task. Your goal is to complete the task as faithfully as you can. While performing the task, think step by step and justify your answers. And the authors have a total of like 16 of these different system instructions. So personally, like the whole paper for me in my mind, like in a sentence is just like augmenting the data with these system messages of various sorts to cause the language model to like be more elaborate and give more of its step-by-step -step reasoning in the output. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's to me like the main idea of the paper. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think what's fascinating is like by thinking step-by-step step and generating the, the null, like the, th really how to think, <laughs> how to think through a problem and then fine tuning on that, like is what makes the expression, you know, of reasoning better of, of, you know, all, all the stuff better is kind of what, what, what that big eye idea is. Um, yeah, I mean, this, maybe this is getting a little bit in like woo territory, but it is very interesting to think about like LLM psychology um, Andre Karpathy posts about this on Twitter, like, he says that, like, interfacing with a language model is, like, interfacing with, like, a really smart person who has the mandate to produce the next word in the next, like, second. <laughs> so, is because, how do you say, like, yeah. these language models, no matter how hard the thought that you're making them think, yeah. They use the same amount of compute, like they use the same amount of compute to produce the next token, whether yeah. it's a really simple thought that produces yeah. the token or whether it's a really complex thought. So like in a way, like these step by step instructions, it, it's like this is getting like kind of woo. It's like it's giving these anxious language models like a little bit more room to breathe when they have to think. Um, and it's like giving them more time. Like I've kind of almost thought like, and this is like a really silly thought. It's like, I wonder if there's been a paper, like an experiment where you just somehow allow the language model to say, um, over and over and over again. And then yeah. it's like, maybe like with that. So I think it like, in a way, I think a lot of the step-by-step -step, uh, instruction basically gives the language model more time to think because it's actually programmed to just produce thoughts and sequence with the same amount of compute. 
Yeah, and I, I think there's there's uh, there's a lot of I would say a lot of things that have come out recently, like like scratch pads and and, and ways of like inserting information into that. But and my, my take is like, um, you know, the the attention on, on the attention works by you know your next word based upon all the other previous words. So by by kind of filling out and having more context, you know, you're, you're more likely to be applying more embeddings and information relative to your subject plus attention to that that next word. So by extrapolating and getting out there, you know, you're you're providing more information to that that next word, um, which is kind of what the scratch pads do and in, in some of the um, in, in some of the latest stuff. But but exactly that, like you're giving it more space to 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 you know, to apply more of the same ideas before it generates that final answer. <laughs> um, and then, and then in this case, you're fine tuning it to do, to, to understand that reasoning better um, based upon the, the data from the other model. Um, in terms of like data set construct, so, so then they talk a little bit about like uh, data set construction, um, each instance in our training data consists of the following triple. Um, yeah, so this is just your system message stuff you're talking about, like the, the all the different variations of uh, like trying to get it to uh, be slightly more uh, verbose or more thoughtful in the in the, the data is generating, which then is going to be fine tuning data. Um, one, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting, I don't know if they talk about this a little bit later. I think they actually talk about this in the next section or the next page. Or yeah, I'm not really sure. But one one thing that's kind of interesting is that they they sampled like five to one from Chat GPT and then GPT four, and they said, if I remember correctly, that they got slightly better performance by first training it all on Chat GPT and then later on GPT four. The idea being there's some kind of curriculum learning thing going on where uh, first you learn from the simpler model and you learn the simpler reasoning from the simpler model and then kind of once you're smarter and once you've graduated almost uh, to the next level, then then you get to learn from GPT-4 and supposedly that kind of hmm. progressive learning uh, may, may train the model somewhat better. Interesting. I, I thought that was kind of order. Yeah, uh, interesting. Well, let's uh, keep going through the data set side of this. Um, I thought this was interesting. So the, this is like different system messages for different um, data sets. Um, so they... So this is talking about again, like how do they come up with their their data sets um, for for um, uh, you know data sets for for essentially um, uh, for, for the for the generation of in, you know for the generation of the data fine tuning. Um, note some of these they sample. I mean they're definitely trying to get a smaller data set, but it's definitely bigger than say an alpaca or vicuna in, in size. Um, talks about the different data sets and types. Um, I just think it's a lot more thoughtful in in kind of the fine tuning data selection. I mean, clearly more thoughtful than you know th than the first versions, and which is the whole idea. Of this can we be more thoughtful in our our generation of of, of fine tuning data and task set? Um, yeah, and this just gives examples here from from some of the data sets how they sample. Um, it's kind of nice. Uh, just they, you know, when they're using, I guess, Chat GPT versus GPT four um, responses, um, you know, it's pretty clear GPT four it's got more to say. <laughs> uh, so, so it's just, you know, the, the, I think I think we I think it's kind of well known that you get these longer responses um, from from it. Uh, you know, obviously it's probably because of the the way it's fine-tuned or aligned, but but that that's just, I think they're trying to note it here. Um, and I think that, you know, I think they're just trying to say, what can you get out? Like, I think there's something about this, like, like um, you've got this parameter size, which limits your speed and inference speed. And like, I, I think you're hinting at this, like sometimes just your data, by, by fine-tuning on a smaller data set, you can just do more with less. And that's kind of the goal. Um, training is just like a lot of detail on like how they did it. Um, so this gets into kind of like the, the baseline models and test sets. Um, the, 
yeah, again, it felt like they were, I mean, to me, it felt like, can I get as close to, can I get close to chat GPT with a smaller, you know, size and can I beat Vicuna clearly yeah. with a, there's, a well there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting diagram or like eval diagram later in the paper where yeah. it kind of show, you know, how Orco lines up against Vicuna, against chat yeah. GPT, against GPT-4, against human performance. Um, yeah, yeah there, there's some really good pictures and I, I feel like those, um, yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll keep going, but that you're right. There, there's some like amazing, I, I thought really good pictures that that kind of showed that how they how they did across a set of evals. It's like the, that, you know, web graph. Um, in terms of capabilities, you get Vicuna prompts, um, awesome prompts. So again, it's, uh, what were the tasks to evaluate Orca? Yeah, I think that was actually like, I don't think that was somehow the main innovation of the paper. Again, I think the main thing is the system prompts for fine tuning. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that was like another kind of major element of the paper is basically like extending the eval data set to include much harder reasoning tasks uh, to, to kind of really see how these models match up against chat GPT, against much larger models like chat GPT or, um, or GPT-4. Um, yeah, I think there's a whole interesting, um, have you seen the, the Hugging Face leaderboard, like um, evals leaderboard? So they, you know, Hugging Face, obviously, uh, it's, I mean, it's really pretty cool. I mean, I feel like everyone's trying to get the spots now, but there's like, there's, there's like three or four eval sets they have on it that, that like sort, sort the, the latest models and everyone's trying to like get up there. Um, but like, you realize that that, that you want like you potentially want like a much broader set and, and and more selective like like I can imagine as a new model comes out you know folks at Harvey or folks at whatever might want to know not just how it's doing on these three eval sets but how's it how does this thing apply to like the four I care about which are these you know very far to the right you know like yeah. you know very specific examples and um so so like this whole field of like Eval, evals and leaderboards feels feels early in its incarnation. You can just tell here too, like if you only ran three eval sets, you wouldn't see all the holes and everything. Um, so, so how do you get a, a broad enough set with enough detail to know like this latest thing is going to be good for what you want want it to be worked on? So I, I I agree with that. There's a lot, you know, they did a really good job of 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 building the the test set here. Um, yeah. I agree. So reasoning, so there's there's stuff on reasoning, there's stuff on open-ended generation. Um, and they talk, you know, they obviously compare against um, Vicuna, which was again, very simple in generation. Um, one, uh, one, one thing that is kind of minor, but I found interesting is like, how, how do these evals actually work? Because ultimately you have to come up with a number, yeah. right? Uh, given, given that the response is completely open-ended. Um, so they end up having to kind of like, programmatically parse uh, the the model responses. And I actually forgot, like, I don't know if there's like an intermediate language model. Pretty sure there's an intermediate language. Yeah, there's an intermediate language model that says something like among zero through three, the answer is, and it kind of converts the long form response answer to like basically a multiple choice question. Um, so I, I also thought that was kind of like interesting. Um, yeah, just the, the amount of processing that needs to be done to actually make these open-ended evals numeric is yes <laughs> yeah I, I totally agree and 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 like can vary quite a bit by the even the harness you choose for the same eval sets um which is what we've seen so like uh yeah so so it's and some so, so some of these and a lot of these i think it's you know a g you know gpt4 is the rater and um evaluation and they, they give some examples later on where like pick a number between zero and ten to rate the you know, the rate this. And, um, and, and so there seems to be, there's probably a, based upon your eval set, there's even different um, approaches to getting that number in the end, um, which I think is also the, the challenge in comparing things. Cool. Uh, can, can you hear me, Brian? Hey, me. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. I lost you for a sec. Hey, sorry about that. Yeah, the internet cut out briefly. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was me or or, no. or you. Oh, awesome. Um, 
any uh any thoughts so, so in this section it's kind of like orca versus chat orca versus gpt4 um i, I think it's just again highlighting the the success of, of the approach or or how well it's yeah doing. i mean you know high level and they i would say two things one they go into this later like in the next section or something like that but across the board across various metrics they get something like a 10% relative improvement um, across kind of simple language modeling benchmarks. But the interesting thing, at least the author's report, is that among these more complex tasks, um, I'm trying to think like what we got here. Yeah, among these more complex tasks relative, for example, to Vicuna, uh, you know, things like formal fallacies or geometric shapes or you know, sports understanding or things like it's a more kind of more complicated task. Uh, Orca ends up performing like way, way better. Um, like they have a bunch of numbers here on a relative basis, you know, 40% better, 400% better. Um, so like there's this general theme where it's like you get you get a moderate boost on the kind of like medium difficulty task, but then on the very difficult tasks that actually required more elaborate reasoning. Uh, yeah, the authors claim that the work could perform is much better and they have some data to back that up. Great. Um, awesome. So I think there's, I mean, there's there's a lot. Oh, this was, I think, an interesting section. So um, the, the subtle point on this one was like, okay, is um, if I, if I only take the GPT-4 outputs, which are supposedly better, you know, better descriptions, better, you know, chain of thought, better reasoning. If I only fine tuned on results from GPT-4, um, what would I, how would I do? And, and that's like removing the chat GPT, like chat GPT gives you more volume of fine tuned data, uh, but less quality. And then, you know, GPT-4 gives you like great, great, you know, great data, but, but lower size. Um, and it's interesting that like by adding the chat GPT data in, you're still better. Like, like one question would be, do you only need the, the really thoughtful results? And, and the answer is like, actually, if you're going to fine tune, you might, you might want a little bit more volume or diversity. You know, there, there's, there's something that, the that, you know, quality versus quantity trade-off here. That's, that's not as like simply clear. You only want one thing. Um, I thought that was pretty kind of interesting in this section. Um, uh, long context. I, I've, I feel like these have been coming up a lot, <laughs> like your, your context window and how well things use your, your context window and how good things are on context windows. I thought this was, you know, a fun point to make, um, that, that, you know, GPT beats, beats some of this, uh, stuff possibly because of how well it uses the context window and, 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 and how well it does on longer contexts. Um, lots of papers recently on this. I don't know if you've, you've seen some of the, some of the stuff I dropped in our, our community on, on the context window stuff, but um, a lot of work going on to understand what's going on in the context windows and have stuff better, better use the, the data there. Um, and these are the ones you're, you were talking about. Um, do you want to yep. describe what, what this looks like and what? Yeah. Sure. I mean, yeah, it's just the idea that like there, you know, there's not just one unific benchmark, but rather there are a lot of different ones. And you can see there's actually quite a difference in performance where it's like, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, so it's like, at least they claim, for example, like chat GPT, at least on some versions of the LSAT or some sections of the LSAT actually performs better than humans, but then on other sections, humans perform better. Um, so then like, you kind of have to evaluate models on different axes and you can see how that plays out here. Um, and at least according to this kind of very simple picture, Orca is strictly, at least in this kind of very whatever, like eight dimensional picture, uh, Orca ends up being strictly worse than chat GPT, but in many ways comparable. Um, and then at least in some dimensions, like the SAT English even outperforms humans. So yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. I just like the graph, like just being able yeah. to see the kind of multi-dimensional evaluation of the very simple graph. And there's like a similar graph, like later on with like kind of yeah. weird data sets. So, I, and I was wondering what, I don't know this data set, but what is the data set that humans crush GPT-4 on? <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know. I, I wanted either. to go look at it. <laughs> um, so what? These, these, um, yeah, and I, I think it's clearly better than like, I mean, that, I mean, you just look at this and you, you can understand all the eval. I mean, it just, this just speaks to 
the depth of evaluation that this team did here too. Like you look at just how much they're tracking across every, you know, everything here. And it's, it's, it's impressive um, the you know, impressive how much evaluation was done here, but you can also see like um, by, by testing different areas, you get, you, you see different holes. Um, yep. And I thought this was pretty good, like, like pretty comparable this, at least this, that's pretty comparable between chat and, um, it's also very interesting, like just as a general commentary on language models, and at least the current limitations is just no one, none of them do well at tracking shuffled objects. So like the spatial reasoning, I mean, obviously GPT-4 is very, very powerful, very impressive, but still uh, the kind of spatial and geometric reasoning is quite limited. Hmm. That's, I mean, that's a really... I mean, that's an interesting just well yeah just look at the graph it's like there's you know it's kind of like a quarter circle here and that you yeah. know the, the whatever top left quadrant is missing for everyone yeah there's a minor minor note interesting um yeah and there's you know i i it again speaks to like i i feel like this speak <laughs> you know that although this this paper was kind of like designed for something else it just again speaks to, i you know i haven't seen um, this put to, put in such a, a good form in terms of like looking at evals and comparing evals. It was well done. Um, world lo logic, table understanding, um, evaluations for safety, truthfulness. So, so truthful QA, by the way, this is one of the ones in the, um, the hugging face leaderboard. So, so they do use this one, um, but it's like a set of three or four. Um, Evaluations. Yep. So I, I think I'm the truthful. It sounds like I'm the truthful one. Again, Orca, you know, chat probably beats beats Orca. I mean, this this section it seemed to be like open AIs put slightly bit more in the truthful and 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 quality, you know, um bias alignment. Uh, it was kind of my take that like the, the Orca data sets didn't didn't get you get you all the way to chat, the GPT, but you know, Vicuna was was way off um on some of these. Well, this was interesting. So pr pretty big. Yeah, I, I kind of honestly, I kind of skimmed this last bit on yeah. safety and toxicity and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're getting uh, questions here. So question from David Pierce. Um, yeah. So, so the eight miles in the trash. Yeah, I, I think he's talking about the, maybe the embedding, <laughs> not the embedding, the, the mixture of experts, maybe you think so the eight models in the trench code is low submission genetics, hence the question versus, um, yeah. So so the, the the mixture of experts kind of latest architecture drops for GTG4. I think uh, I think we're going to do a mixture of experts paper soon. So I was talking with, with Brian about this, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of we'll hop into that, but that's a good, good question. Are we comparing apples and apples when uh, we're talking billions of parameters is the thing that like differentiates the models um i do think there is something to be said for like you know the, the and i think i think when we dive into the mixture of expert side like it is um you know it the billions of the, the billions of parameter size which is like are how big is this thing um it does define your cost a bit it does define your inference latency there, there is there is aspects to it that like make it as a nice metric for comparability, but, but you're right. As you get to mixture of experts versus not like the, you know, quite different things we're, we're comparing when we do that. Um, the, yeah. So we'll, we'll kind of keep, keep moving here. Um, ChatGPT one. Okay. So yeah, this is, this is just again, toxicity, uh, how it does in toxicity versus, um, versus GPT-4. Um, and, and again, I think they're trying to beat Vicuna. Um, you're probably not going to meet your your, your chat in uh, GPT-4 results. Um, and again, it's probably model size plus plus kind of data sets that you're fine tuned on that 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 have you get you there. Um, uh, yeah, the last the last bit right here, kind of before the paper ends. I, this is very minor, but I I found interesting is like having these smaller 10 billion type models like alpaca or vicuna or orca um augmenting them with tools might be a very good future direction given it's kind of like you're working with this constraint of fewer parameters to think 
Um, yeah. And it's like, if you can free up some of that by giving them tools, then you somehow you have more memory to memorize other things. Um, Cause I mean, you know, it's like, if you ask like Llama or, or sorry, Vicuna or whatever Orca to like add two plus two and it comes back with four, it's actually doing like 10 billion, you know, floating point operations in order to actually like compute that when it could just like call a calculator or something like that. So um, yeah. I imagine, and this is just my guess that these, these, these kind of smaller models will get way better when there is an easy way to add tool use to them. Yeah, I, I don't know if you got to play with code interpreter yet. I got to I got to play with it over I play, you know, we Not yet. Yeah, I used it over the weekend. Um and it's magical for data analysis. <laughs> like if you so so all of you on this listening and you haven't used code interpreter yet, go into the beta, like and you pay for twenty dollars a month for for GPT four access. Go into the beta, like there's a whole alpha beta, like in your settings, you gotta enable it um for, for the alpha product. Uh, and then you can upload up to 100 megs of data and um, and actually do do some magic on it. it. It's slightly buggy. It OEMs a lot on big data, big you know uh, on, on like complex stuff. But 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 if you you manage the you know the complexity of your ask and your data size, it's pretty magical right now. And some of the analytical stuff can do. So so I think there's a big promise there of of like when to call tools. Maybe those tools are code. Um, and and you're right. Like I think your earlier section of like the um, uh, the sorting, uh, you know, the, the sorting stuff or the, the highlighting of where the problems are, maybe the the right things to do are are call out to our tools. And then and I think the point on this one that, that I had highlighted here is like there is this trade off in exactly what you're saying, which is um, there's probably a trade off between memory memorizing something in in terms of parameters and learning concepts and and and, and like. Right now, you're kind of using the model's you know, parameters to do all of it. Um, it you know, you're learning, yeah. yeah, concepts, and you're memorizing, and it's kind of like the point here is it kind of struggles. Um, you know, it, it struggles to trade that off as you get the smaller, smaller models. Um, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, what do we got here? And I think we're kind of at the conclusion here. Um, so research suggests small, well, yeah. So I, I think like there's a lot of potential here. I think we're going to definitely see, you know, fine tuning. We'll definitely see, uh, models using other models outputs for, uh, for building. It is worth noting <laughs> one, one, one interesting thing here that's probably going to limit some of this. I, I don't know if you noticed that I think like all the Googles and open AIs have put terms of service, like trying to limit this too <laughs> and, and so, so like are, are we going to get this like as um you know it, it's something that's kind of blowing up in the llama oss communities but like the the how much people are going to use it or how much people can 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 i think there's going to be questions on limitations of, of this too like like where can i can use it from a corporate perspective um, yeah i i uh i i like to, I'm totally private with candidates obviously not going to share you know recruiting info or personal info but i will note this week i spoke with two candidates completely anonymized who are doing a side projects variety of sketchy stuff that they told me about this recruiter was kind of like weirded out and they all have to do it open source because they were using you know chat gpt or they were using like uh, commercial OCR software to do things that skirted copyright laws or things like that. Or honestly, stuff that's way sketchier that I'm not going to talk about on Zoom. Uh, and and you know they're trying to do this stuff as side projects, and they uh, they they what they do is they use open source models. So I feel like this stuff is really going to explode if there's ever like or you know whenever there's kind of an open source very large foundation model like GPT four that's just uh, you can open source. It also goes back to the, the other thing about intermediate representations. Like, again, like why this stuff works is that you get a lot of the step-by-step -step reasoning, but what would be way better is if you got like all of the neuron activations, you know, for all of the whatever trillion, I don't know, 10 trillion, multiple trillion parameters that are inside GPT-4. And if you could actually use those as signals instead of just the, the outputs. So I, I do think like a lot of this stuff's gonna get really interesting when the large foundation models become open source. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I've been kind of hoping that Facebook or Meta would come up with a, like a licensing model for Llama, get, you know, my, my fingers were crossed, although I think the lawsuits flying, uh, you know, are, are, are probably going to hinder that, you know, 
but maybe, maybe Harvey can help out with the lawsuit. Kind of. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, well, awesome. Um, awesome to to have everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Brian, for, for, for joining this, this episode. And no, this uh, is super fun. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and th th thanks for everyone for joining.